so I'll address this question. This is a, a good question. I don't think I, the, that, this little detail didn't come up. And this is a little detail that bothers a lot of students. And so if I have a vector uh, uh, five, I'm sorry, negative five, uh, four, so I can draw that vector on my x and y plane. I start at the origin <clears throat> and I go uh, over negative five and up four. Here's a picture of it. Um, anyway, and then uh, I can find the magnitude of that vector. We worked on that uh, Monday. Uh, and I, uh, I like to do these little Pythagorean theorems. It's just a quick Pythagorean theorem in my head. I like to just do it in my head. I get good at it. You can get good at it too. Uh, 25 plus 16. Do you agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 25 plus 16 is 41. So there you go. The length of the vector or the magnitude of the vector is the square root of 41, you know, which is roughly six and a half, roughly something like yeah, that. 6.4. 6.4. Um, but anyway, I'll just leave it like this, but that's the magnitude. So we said so we kind of learned this Monday, you know, if, if you've given the components, can you find the magnitude and the direction angle? And so the direction angle was uh, the tangent inverse of, uh, y over of y over x. So that would be y over x. So now, you know, I, so I can kind of work and find these things without drawing the picture. I, I drew the picture first, but I can start doing this without drawing the picture. But it might lead to this error that you're sort of discussing. Yeah. Um, so if I type this in my calculator and, and ask for this, uh, this I will round off to the nearest uh, degree or tenth of a degree. It's Can you negative uh, 38.7. Negative 38.7 degrees, okay. Okay, so guess what? <clears throat> uh, if I drew that, negative 38.7, uh, that's not right. I mean, that vector is not at that angle. That vector is over here in quadrant two. I, Drew the vector, it's in quadrant two. It's... So here's what we have to know about tangent inverse, about using tangent inverse. Tangent inverse, I mean, this goes back to inverse theory. The, the range of tangent inverse ha is restricted to angles between uh, negative 90 and 90, or negative pi over two and pi over two. And my calculator knows that. My calculator knows about the restricted range of tangent inverse. Uh, all trig inverses have this restricted range. I mean, it's a technical little aspect of trig that not all st students know that well. Um, I could get into the <laughs> whys and so forth. Uh, let me just say something. If I, if I ask you for the, the sine inverse of a half, what we're looking for is the angle whose sine is a half. And you might say, you might have it memorized. You might a couple, use a couple a areas of the unit circle. Right? Well, right, you use your unit circle. That's a famous number, right. that, and it, it's 30 degrees. 30 degrees, yeah. That's right. So it's 30 degrees. But now wait a minute. Uh, it's 30 degrees. But, 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 but where else is the sine one half? Opposite of that. Right? Well, actually, uh, actually, all 30 degree angles except um except wait a minute down here in qu these quadrants the sine is negative one half right. so it wouldn't be those okay but sine is positive above the x-axis so sine would be so the other answer would be 30 degrees and then this 30 this 30 would be called uh 150 do you, you know uh 180 minus 30 there so, so there are two answers so there's two answers now wait a minute wait a minute if this sine inverse function is a function, we don't want there to be two answers. We want there to be one answer because every input should have one output to the definition of a function. And so in the development of this function, we have a restricted range. Uh, so I'm explaining the, the ins and outs of why we have this restricted range. So, so we don't want two answers or you know, if I kept going around the unit circle, there'd be millions of answers, actually. So we don't want that. So sine inverse has a restricted range. So we, we, the answer is, there is not two answers. There's, there is only one correct answer. Due to the restricted range of sine inverse, the answer is 30 degrees, or, or pi over 6. Um, so that's the long story there. Of course, I tried to make it as short as I could. Any, uh, so that's... So sine inverse is restricted to those two quadrants, which again is 
<clears throat> between negative 90 and 90 is how you can say that, or negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And so is tangent inverse, and our calculator knows that. Cosine inverse is restricted differently from 0 to pi. It's good to kind of know that, maybe. And our calculator knows that, too. So, because this is a negative number, uh, it chose the calculator, we have a restricted range of quadrant one and four for, for tangent inverse, so it chose an angle in quadrant four. Based on the picture of the vector, we know it's not in quadrant four, it's in quadrant two. And so what we do is, it's, so it's not, so the negative 38.7 is not the right answer, but the related angle of 38.7 is correct, but it's 38.7 over in quadrant two, and the way to get that would be to add 180 to this, or subtract him from 180, however you want to say that. And so the appropriate answer is not this. We need the adjustment of adding 180 degrees and whatever that is. That is 141.3. Thank you. <clears throat> and that's worth discussing because that's one of the errors on my first quiz or somewhere on my test. That's kind of one of the errors. And it, could get you in physics class as well. Uh, right. It's, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to maybe make that discussion so long, but I, I think I did a thorough job explaining the, the restricted range of these trig inverse functions. I actually recall that a little bit now that you're teaching me yeah. again from uh, trig and a little bit of calculus one. Right, right. Right, so, so draw the vector, see where it ends up, and don't totally trust your calculator. Right, right, draw the vector. Okay, good. Um, well, you know, welcome back. And, and there's a lot of good problems in 11.1, and I, I really don't want to go answer questions yet. If, please, please keep working on homework and save your questions. Come to my office hours for questions. But I, I'm going to move on into 11.2 uh, because I think that's a good place to be. And today we have a little shorter class, by the way. We we get out in 50 minutes, although. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so we'll, uh, so I'm just going to keep sort of talking and, and move into section 11 too, and then Friday, maybe I'll slow down and answer some questions, uh, if you have some. Um, and so 11 two, we move into space, uh, and that's, I, I just, this is kind of a, we move into space, um. <clears throat> So here we go. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> I don't want to confuse you, but I'll explain this. Uh, listen, so I'll start with this, but this is not exactly right here. So, so we've always worked in the two-dimensional xy plane. Okay. Well, now we're going to have a, a third dimension. So we'll have a z-axis, and then you might kind of think it comes out at you. It, it, it does. So the z-axis comes out at you. Uh, the way I draw that on a 2D blackboard is I, I sort of draw this coming out at me. But the truth is, uh, uh, we don't do this. What we do instead is we, and, but you know what, in physics you might, uh, <clears throat> but in our math class, we t then what we do instead is we sort of, we take the x, y axis and put it, we rotate this. And here's how we talk. We, <clears throat> call the z-axis going up, and we rotate the x-y plane, so it's sort of the flat horizontal plane here. Here's the y-axis, and here's the x-axis coming out at me. So are you sort of with me? I mean, maybe, you know, all your life, there's the x-y plane. It might seem obvious to let the z-axis come out at you, but we don't. We rotate it, make the x-y plane sort of this horizontal plane here, and the z-axis going up. So by the way, that's three-dimensional space. And now what I didn't do was draw, it gets a little uh, messy if I draw the, the negative part of the axes, uh, you know, but there is, there's a, a negative y-axis over here, right? That's the, <clears throat> uh, the negative x-axis is going back into the board. <clears throat> and the negative z-axis is coming down here. 
So that that it's a little messy. Let's see. Can we plot the point? Uh, uh, three, two, one. And so just drawing and working with you know three dimensions on a two D piece of paper or a two D blackboard takes a little drawing and skills. I mean, it's almost like you needed an art class before you came here. Uh, or, but not really. And so just plotting the point three, two, one can be a little tricky and misleading. Watch, uh, that's three in the X direction, which is out at me, uh, two in the Y direction. But look, I don't go, what I do is I leave here and go over two, you know, which puts me kind of here, which is kind of parallel. See this parallel axis here? Yeah, now I'm really making a mess. You should start drawing too much on here. But I, in other words, out three, over two, and that one, up one. I need to go up one. Well, I go up one. There it is. So here's this point, three, two, one. You know, when you leave this little sort of trail of how you got there, it, you can sort of see the depth, and it, maybe it kind of makes sense. Uh, when you don't leave the trail there, it kind of, it's kind of hard to tell where the hell that is, you know? It almost looks like it's below the XY plane, you know, but it's it's not. <laughs> I mean, it's tough. It, 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 you know, yeah. we're drawing 3D things onto a 2D blackboard, uh, so <clears throat> or whiteboard. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, one more time, a vector now in space has three coordinates. It has the, the an X. I'm sorry, I said coordinates. When I talk about a point, it's an X and Y and Z coordinate. I think when I talk vectors, I should use the word component, right? X and Y and Z components. And it would, if I do the vector three, two, one, you know, the other day I tried to distinguish, you know, a point is not a vector, but the vector three, two, one drawn from the origin lands at the point. The vector three, two, one terminates at the point three, two, one. So I can draw this. I would come out three over two and up one and then try to draw the vector, which, and there it is from the origin out at me. And it's, it just doesn't look that good. I mean, so so there, there can be some frustrating moments drawing uh, and trying to depict these things, but it, it, with some practice, it does a little better. Even, but I mean, some things just don't look that good. I mean, this thing coming out, out at me doesn't look that great. Uh, you know, it might look better if I drew the vector, some other vector. Let's try something else. And what if I had a vector W that was, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, let me try this, negative six, uh, negative four, three. <clears throat> You know, it gets a little weird when you start getting negative too, actually. It's kind of fun sort of to stay where everything's positive, but that's not always the way the world works. Let's try this. So I'm going to go, what am I doing? Back negative six on the x-axis. Back one, two, three, four, five, six. From there, I want to go over negative four on the y-axis. So, so over here, negative four. Which I know, in a way, you know, when you when you look down here, that doesn't look like it's over negative four, but but it is. Back negative six, over negative four, and then what? Up three, up three. See, you know, right there. If I stop right there, I'm I'm sitting in the x y plane. Do you see? Which is again a little hard to see. But but then when I move up three, then I'm up three units above the x y plane. And uh, anyway, there's that point, and the vector would look like this. Oh my God. It would, from the origin to that point. I mean, that's vector W there. Uh, it just doesn't look good. It looks like it's going straight up. You know, it just doesn't look too good. I'm, but it's accurate. I didn't really do anything wrong. If I, like I said, if I leave this little, sort of this little trail of how I got there, um, 
I don't know, that adds a little depth to it. That sort of, but it also kind of clutters up the picture, but it, it you can kind of see a little clearer. So anyway, maybe drawing these vectors and lines, we will draw three-dimensional shapes uh, once we get going here uh, into calculus toward the end of this chapter. We'll, we'll draw three-dimensional shapes, uh, but these lines don't come out too well in three dimensions. And lines and vectors uh, don't look all that great <clears throat> on, my, on, my, on my board. <clears throat> um, but that doesn't mean you don't work with them and understand all the concepts. As a matter of fact, can we, uh, let's, can we find the magnitude of B? Um, what is the length of that vector B? And maybe you think, oh, now we're in three dimensions. We need some new formula. Well, uh, it's really still, well, it's, remember the magnitude from Monday was Pythagorean's theorem, right? Kind of in the two-dimensional plane. Well, now it's sort of a 3D version of Pythagorean's theorem. I could sort of prove it to you, but it is this. It is just the square root of, I'm going to talk like the book does, B1 squared plus B2 squared plus B3 squared. That's what they call the, uh, the first and second and third component of B, or the X, Y, and Z component of B, or let's just do it with these numbers. It would be the square root of uh, 9 plus 4 plus 1. Right, you guys? Uh, so the length of V is the square root of 14. Like I said, sort of a, sort of a, sort of a 3D Pythagorean theorem. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the other thing I like to do once we start working in space. And here we are drawing our best on the blackboard. Again, the way we do it is the x-axis is coming out at us. It's sort of like the yz plane is this board. The yz plane is this wall. And the x-axis is coming out at us. Uh, let me draw that like that. Um, you know what it is? This really helps. It's, it's like this room. And this won't show up too great on the video here. But look, it's like this room. Uh, that corner of the room can be thought of as the origin, zero, zero, zero. So what's this, what's this corner where these two walls meet? That's uh, the z-axis. The z-axis is the phrase there. Uh, the x-axis is that one coming out at you. And the y-axis is here, running along that crease of the wall. So now, I mean, and so I'm out here, and I'm in what's called the first octant. See, now that we have space, we divide it into eight octants instead of four quadrants, I guess. Does that make sense to you? And we're out here in the first octant is where everybody's positive or all the variables are positive. Now listen, I don't have the rest of them numbered. We don't, I don't have one through eight numbered and memorized which ones they are. Uh, so we call, but we call the first octant the first octant. So, and that's kind of, oftentimes that's kind of, I just quickly go, Sloppy, but that's my. That, I'm looking at the first octave, you know, and uh, but I lay, should lay it like that for you to be clear. <clears throat> but it is some fun sometimes to try to imagine in this room. I mean, in other words, hang on. This vector three, two, one is uh, you know three uh, over two out three over two. I'm off the video. <laughs> up one, you know, it's about right here. Uh, is that point three two one, and the vector was would be going from the origin to this point. That's kind of what I tried to draw there, but <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so then we have these coordinate planes. Okay, so I've already sort of stumped said this, but here we are a little more officially here. Uh, then this is called the YZ plane. Or okay, starting with the, the good old XY plane is sort of now here, and it's sort of sitting horizontally. In this room, it would be the floor. I'm walking around on the XY plane. When you're in the XY plane, can you tell me a true fact? If you're a point wandering around the XY plane, one true fact is your Z coordinate is zero. zero. Thank you, you're in the XY plane. You're Right, so your z coordinate is zero, or in fact, the name of the xy plane. <clears throat> you know, again, we call it. We call there's there's three of these what we call coordinate planes, uh, and of course.
course, this is all pretty obvious, but there's the xy plane, and its name is z equals zero. Uh, it's, or its equation, I'm sorry, its equation is z equals zero. Uh, hey, there's this plane, which <clears throat> is the yz plane. And by the way, if you're in the yz plane, I guess x is zero. Yeah, yeah. And so that's the name, or the equation is x equals zero is the name of the yz plane. Uh, and by the way, in our room, let's back to our room for a second here, that is this wall, right, you guys? So it's kind of cool. The yz plane is this, you know, the way it looks on in my drawing is also the way it is in, in my life. This is the yz plane, this wall. Uh, the xy plane is the floor, and the xz plane is that wall. <clears throat> and, you know, these meet at 90 degree angles. I didn't do a great job there. But the xz plane is that wall. And uh, that's, uh, the, I guess, y equals zero. Yeah, it just made me think of this. I don't know. <clears throat> now, by the way, so, <clears throat> so we're starting to learn about something new here now planes uh, in space now. I mean, we've never talked about planes. We've talked about lines and curves and parabolas and in, in, in two dimensions. I mean, we were always working in the two-dimensional xy plane. So now that we're in three-dimensional space, there are these things slicing through space called planes. Uh, and these are the three very famous ones, the three coordinate planes. Um, and here are their equations. I wonder if you would know what this is. Uh, well, I'm a, this is a plane. Z equals one is a plane. Uh, could you draw it? Could you see it? Could you think about it? That's X, that's Y. Like to see my, sometimes I don't do a good job. That X should look a little more coming a little more at me here. Uh, but we just got done saying Z equals zero is the XY plane, the floor. So what's Z equals one? Just comes out at you. One unit up, a horizontal plane, a horizontal plane, one unit above the XY plane. Yeah. Uh, watch, I'll try to draw that. Uh, uh, okay, watch, I'm trying to draw that. There, there it is. We tend to draw a plane with like a rectangular border or a square border. The truth is it's infinite in all directions. Uh, it's just an infinite plane at z equals 1. Where's z equals 2? One unit above that. z equals 10. Up here, there's a plane at z equals 10. Uh, what about y equals 6? I think over on the y-axis at 6. Hang on. That's the y-axis at 6. There would be like a wall right here. Right, you guys? Coming out at me. I'll try to draw that. You know, it gets messy, and I, I'm doing it quick. I'm not really taking my time too much. But that's a wall coming out at you at y equals 6. What about x equals 3? I guess you go out to x equals 3, and there would be a wall right here, x equals 3. You, that'd, be, hey, that'd be a good way to teach. I could put a wall up there, teach behind the wall, like the wizard behind the curtain. <laughs> Can I draw that? Oh. And that's kind of an easier one to draw. It's just a wall, three units out in front of that wall. Right, a, a plane. Now these are very basic. Well, first I started with very basic coordinate planes, and now I'm 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 I'm, I'm stretching it to planes that are parallel to those coordinate planes. Real easy. Z equals one. Z equals ten. X equals three. Right. Very easy planes parallel to the coordinate planes. <clears throat> Uh, so I got away from vectors and started talking about the space. I mean, this is how we need to talk and think in space. So, so in this section 11.2, you know, we, 
we still can talk about some 3D vectors now, but we also, there's a lot of stuff to talk about in 3D, these, these planes. Uh, <clears throat> By the end of this chapter, just a week or so down the road, a week or two down the road, uh, we'll be we'll discuss slanting planes. I mean, there's right planes can come slanting through here at all kinds of angles, and and though they're the, uh, we'll wait a few weeks or a couple weeks before we get to that. But but they they have more more sophisticated equations. That's up in eleven five, by the way. But we'll get there. We'll learn about these planes that come slanting through here. So these are just very basic today, very basic planes. <clears throat> but, but what planes are is when you're in space, these, these things that I'm drawing, these planes, are, that's the first example of what we call surfaces. And, and surfaces in space, I guess you can sort of tell when you're a surface in space because you have surface area. I mean, that's but the technical word for it is surface. Uh, it's not a curve. Actually, a curve in space is something different. A curve in space would be like a, a you know, a path in space, a, a rope in space, uh, uh, but you know, a very thin rope in space with no surface area. Uh, but a surface is is like a, a plane. So the the first type of surface we we run into is planes, and we'll get into more sophisticated planes as we go. Uh, but these are these are just very basic planes here. The, these three coordinate planes sort of define space. I mean, this is how you sort of define space with these three. Uh, and then there's these other ones. I've, I mean, this this is all just getting you thinking in 3D is what I'm doing. Uh, we, we've never been here before, uh, in a way. Unless you know, again, you made maybe you've done some 3D. <clears throat> well, whatever. <clears throat> Imagine how <clears throat> you know. I don't know if you're, you know, nowadays everybody's kind of a, a gamer. They're playing games, and these games are in 3Ds. These video games are in 3Ds and 3D, and and and, and it, maybe you, a, a programmer who wants to write games and develop games, and you can. I mean, I had a couple students in the past who were into that, and they really loved Cal 3. I mean, that's kind of the, the way you talk in space and you're moving around space. Uh, you need this 3D language. Uh, <clears throat> so here's another uh, surface in space that, that pops up in 11.2, a different surface besides some planes. Uh, 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 the first surface we'll learn about here is a sphere. A sphere. Um, <clears throat> and I think... Maybe I'll just tell you, <clears throat> without really deriving or developing this, I think I'll just sort of tell you that the, the general equation, general form uh, of a sphere is, is this equation. Um, uh, x minus x naught squared plus y minus y naught squared, that's a y subscript zero is what I'm uh, plus z minus z subscript zero squared equals r squared. And I don't know if you recall circles, which it's been a calculus, you don't do a whole lot with circles, but, uh, but that, that's the standard form of a circle, centered at x naught, y naught, with a radius of r. Well, now this is a sphere, centered at the center, is the is the point x naught y naught z naught, and it's got a radius of r. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I just sort of spilled the beans there. I could have uh, I could have kind of derived this. I, I'll just tell you. It's sort of if you read the book, or it's sort of it's derived from the distance formula. I mean. Uh, what is a sphere? A sphere is, you ready for this? A sphere is the set of points that are equidistant from a fixed point. The set of points equidistant from a fixed point. That, that equidistant is the radius, 
the fixed point is the center. Everything that's a, the same distance from the center is the, is the surface points of a sphere. When we talk about a sphere or a surface, I think we're, we are talking about the, like the, the surface. You know, it's not really interior to the sphere. It's, it's the surface of the sphere that we're describing with this equation. You plot a bunch of points in space, this equation will plot out a sphere. spheres like this. Look at this. <laughs> I prefer spheres like this. Uh, can you tell me why I prefer spheres like this? What's cool about a sphere like that? I mean, that's, that's its equation. What'd you say? Which is three. Well, oh well, yeah, say what I, what you really want to say is this is a nice sphere because, yeah. It's radius three. So it's radius three. Which is nice. Yeah. Say it. Centers. It's centered. At zero zero zero, right? Thank you. Right. That's, what, that's what he wanted to say. He knew it was nice. He knew <laughs> something was nice about it. But right, it's centered at zero zero zero, right? You guys, if if, the, if this is zero zero zero, it sort of collapses to this simpler simpler equation, and it is radius three. Uh, so when they're off center, the the equation gets a little more complicated, of course, and it's and then they're a little harder to draw. Perhaps I mean, this might be hard. Can I draw this? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Sphere. I mean, again, this is a 3D surface. We're going to have to practice drawing some 3D surfaces. Uh, again, fairly soon we'll get into some more, but I'm going to, what do I want to do here? I'll put a little negative axis here. My, my center is 0, 0, 0. Uh, I want to go, I, I want to go over 3. Now I want to go over 3. I want to go back 3. I want to go out 3 here. You know, actually, if I just draw this, can I, can I say I've, I've sort of drawn the equator of the sphere? I've, I've sort of drawn the, the, the belt or the equator of the sphere. It's distorted looking. I mean, it, well, hang on. If I go up three and down three and connect this, wow, well, anyway, that's another cross section of the sphere. I think I've just, done the cross section in the XZ plane is sort of what I just did. If I do one more cross section in the YZ plane, I think I'll try to connect this to that. I don't know how great that is. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. Um, not it's supposed to be elliptical, but it looks a little elliptical, but it's not. It's a sphere of radius three. Anyway, again, drawing it may not be the crucial, you know, understanding what it is and thinking about it. I mean, part of this is I'm drawing it for you, but what we, we need to start seeing this in our heads, right? We, we have 3D little pictures in our heads, little pictures like this in our heads, uh, perhaps. <clears throat> when we see this equation, this picture pops up in my head. Right. <clears throat> uh, they do this to you, though, when we talk about spheres. They'll do this to you. Uh, watch this. Uh, So I just made that up. That's an equation. It's a con look. Uh, this is. <clears throat> I mean, I sort of just took a big leap with you here today. You know, we went into space, and then I, 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 I didn't. You know, I'm, I'm starting to. <clears throat> I'm starting to write equations now that have x's, y's, and z's in them. Equations with x's, y's, and z's in them are surfaces in space. Now, now, hang on. Let me just back up. When I first started, what, what kind of equations did I write on the board? Uh, well, they, they were very simple. <laughs> they didn't have a whole lot of X's, Y's. And they were, there was one, there was another one, right? I didn't, I was very, so, so all of a sudden, boom, we've got equations with X's, Y's, and Z's in them. 
Um, and depending on what's going on, the, the, they might be, uh, there are all kinds of different surfaces. In other words, here, here, here where, you know, this is a surface in space. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, you know, I mean, who the hell knows what this is, uh, right? But it, an equation with x's, y's, and z's in it is something in space. It's some kind of a surface in space. Uh, this was, and I, I don't know what this is. Uh, and I'm not going to plot points and try to plot it, and then he's not a famous one. I just made one up, and you can you sort of do that. Anything with x's, y's, and z's, some kind of equation with x's, y's, and z's, is a surface in space. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a that's kind of a trippy one. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, some sort of powerful 3D grapher, perhaps some sort of computer program, or. Uh, or even some kind of 3D app, drawing app, mathematical 3D graphing app. But you, maybe you could type this in and, and see what it looks like. It'd probably be a mess. But it would be hard to even see. It might be not be a beautiful surface. <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> so we did. We took this big leap. Equations with X's, Y's, and Z's are, are surfaces in space, and we're studying this particular kind called spheres. This one was centered at the origin. This one is not centered at the origin. And in order to sort of get him into standard form, you have to kind of make him look like this. Do you guys have some mathematical skills and recollect what I might want to do to help myself get it into this form? I want this form so I can see the center and the radius. Do you know what those skills were that would help you do that? Well, completing the square. Completing the square is just kind of helps you fit it into this form. You, what you, here's, I'll help you. What you do is kind of group the X's together. I'll move that 6X over there. Group the X's together. Uh, I'm going to leave a little space. Uh, I'm going to group the Y's together. Y squared plus 8Y. Kind of group them together. Leave a space. I'm going to group the z's together, uh, z squared minus z, leave a space, and then it still equals this negative 1 over here. And then i got to complete the square. Actually, i got to complete the square three times. Um, completing the square means uh, add the appropriate number here to make this a perfect square trinomial. Okay, do you know what that perfect number is? Yes, uh, it's always half of that number squared. That's completing the square. It's half of that, so it's, uh, I need to add a nine. So I add a nine, and now I force this to be a perfect square trinomial. Uh, what that means is, in the next step, is it's x minus three squared, yeah, I, right? Now, hang on a second. If I add a nine, I better add nine to the other side. So I've got to add a nine over here, you're right. Uh, what about here with the y values? I should add uh, 16. 16. Right, right, right. Add a 16. I'll go over here and add 16. Uh, what about here? I should with these z's. Half of this squared. One fourth. Yeah, half of this is a half squared. It's a fourth. I'm adding a fourth. I'm adding a one fourth. So I'm sorry, I gotta add a one fourth. I'm also trying to stay in the line here on the video, but we'll see how that works. Uh, so here we go. This is a y plus four squared. That, that's uh, it's automatically this perfect square trinomial. That 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 half of that before you squared it is what we get here. Uh, this is gonna be uh, z minus a half minus a half. Yeah, squared. And then I should just add up these numbers, which is not real pretty there. 29, 29, 24 and a fourth. 24 and a fourth. 97 fourths, I might call that. Negative one, that was a negative one. No, I think I'm right. So, cool, uh, we put it into standard form. It was not in standard form, we put it into standard form, 
completing the square a few times there. Is a homework problem or two is like that. Uh, so now we know the center. What is the center? Three, negative four, one half. That's right, three, negative four, one half. That's the center, and the radius is the square root of that, which is the square root of 97 fourths, or if you don't mind, the square root of 97 over two. Is that okay with you? That's the radius squared, so the radius is the square root of that, which is the square root of 97 over two which I'd kind of like to know roughly what that is. I know actually it's roughly a 10 divided by two. It's roughly a five, but it's a little less than five. What is it? 4.9. Okay, thank you, 4.9-ish. Uh, I don't really want to draw him. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, <clears throat> I don't really want to draw him, but I do want to ask this question, although it won't be, I don't know, well, it's not, it's a, yeah, I want to ask this interesting question, although I wish it was a little more interesting, but we'll see what happens here. I want to ask this question, which, if any, of the coordinate planes Does this sphere intersect? So that's my question, and we worked on that sphere. We put him into standard form so we can see his center and we know his radius, and I can see it and think about it, or maybe I do need to sort of draw it to help me answer this question. Uh, hopefully you understand this question. Which, if any, of the coordinate planes does this sphere intersect? You know, I guess if this sphere was centered right out here, again, here I am out in my first octet. If it was centered here and just had a nice small little radius, it wouldn't be intersecting. It would not be intersecting any of the coordinate planes. Do you see what I mean? Right? The, the, that, the, the XZ plane is way the hell over there. The XY plane is way down there. And the uh, YZ, it, right. So this one would be none. A nice small sphere like this. Uh, but yours is, I don't know, do you have an answer? Is it all of them? I think it's all of them. Because the radius is bigger than, well, so this center is sort of, let's see, what is this? This is the x, this is x equals 3. So that's 3 units away from, what does that mean? x equals 3, that's 3 units the center is x equals 3, so that's 3 units away from the yz plane, or the origin, but or the yz plane, isn't it? If x is 3, it's 3 units out at you, and that's 3 units away from that yz plane. So if it's 3 units away from the yz plane, and it's got that radius, I think it's going to intersect the yz plane. This is four units away from the whatever. Uh, this is half a unit away from the from the x y plane. Are you following me? I'm trying to kind of logically do it without really drawing the whole thing out. I'm saying the radius is pretty. The radius is bigger than any of these distances. Here I will draw it though. Three out here, negative four on the y. That's back here. Which again, that negative four, that's that distance away from this plane, this xz plane. And then it's half a unit up. So half a unit up, there's the center. That's a half a unit above the xy plane. And with that big old radius of 4.9, I think it's gonna intersect all these planes, right? I think the answer's all of them. All of them. Um, <clears throat> mm 
Oh, good. Talked about planes, the corner planes. We're in space a little bit. Um, I got um, getting low on time, but let me let me do a couple more things. Back back to vectors for a second. So now, with, without drawing it, I, I, I can have this vector, uh, uh, you know, negative four, three, two, and uh, <clears throat> it's, it's in space. I don't really have to draw it, but but they'll ask you a question like this: Can you find a unit vector? in the direction of V. That's kind of how they word things. Now, I already talked about this uh, yesterday, or Monday. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't, maybe I didn't word it like that. Uh, do you remember what we did Monday with regards to a unit vector? Uh, the, well, <clears throat> I said, I said that I can make any vector into a unit vector if I divide by its magnitude. Divide by its own magnitude. And that's what this is going to do. It's going to, if, if I, right, so if I find out how long this is and divide him by how long it is, I will make a vector that's one unit long, and that's what a unit vector is. And, and will it still be pointing in this direction? Yes. I mean, because when you, you multiply by a scalar, when you multiply by a half or a third or whatever you multiply by, it, it just shortens it up or lengthens it, but it keeps it in the same direction. So, so that's all this is. Find a unit vector, which means divide him by his magnitude. So I'm going to say this is it's a new vector, though. It's not the same vector. I'm calling it u, but it is just the vector v divided by his own magnitude. That, that's how you can make any kind of unit vector. And so here we go. It's the vector v, negative 4, 3, 2, divided by his magnitude, which is anybody? A square root of 29. All right. Yes. Square root of 29. I think that's what I did in my head. 16 plus 9 plus 4. That's what I... 16 plus 9 plus 4. Square root of 16 plus 9 plus 4. Cool. So in a way, uh, I'm done. I mean, that's my unit vector, although... I mean, I'm done. You know, that, that's a perfectly fine notation, to tell you the truth. But... <clears throat> uh, but you may be tempted to actually divide, and, and then, then that, that would look like this. Uh, right. Uh, <clears throat> negative 4 over the square root of 29, comma, 3 over the square root of 29, comma, 2 over the square root of 29. But anyway, that's, and it, you know, that's not V. Uh, you know, there's V. Uh, he's pointing in the same direction as V. He's a, he's a scalar multiple of V, and, and, but he's a, specifically, he's a unit vector. He's one unit long. Do you want to prove he's one unit long? I mean, maybe it's obvious. Maybe, watch, I don't know. Well, it's obvious to me, but I've been doing this for years. If, let's find the magnitude of him. If I wanted to find the magnitude of him, I would square him, square him, and square him. You ready? That's 16 over 29, do you agree? Plus 9 over 29, plus 4 over 29. When you add that up, that's 29 over 29. It's beautiful how it works, but it's, uh, it's, it's one. I mean, you're, you're guaranteed to have a unit vector when you divide a vector by its own magnitude. <clears throat> and like I said, I'm not interested in, in drawing this. You know, uh, I, I did explain to you a little bit that the IJK notation, and the book uses IJK notation, and the physics class uses the IJK notation. Actually, I didn't use the letter K the other day because I wasn't in three dimensions. But uh, if I wanted to use IJK notation, I just want to say that this vector is, you know, it's, it's negative four I, and, and I call I, I as a little vector. Again, because he's a little unit vector, I think some, physics classes, some people put a little hat on it, but I, to me it's just a vector, uh, plus 3j plus 2k. Now, by the way, what is 
Now, yesterday I told you the vector i was the vector 1, 0. It was the unit vector in the x direction. But now that I'm in 3D, I better call it 1, 0, 0. One, zero, zero. Thank you. And j would be 0, 1, 0, one, zero and k would be 0, zero, zero, zero 1. Right. You know, I, these three vectors, listen to the way I talk here. This is, you won't, this is, I'm just going to talk like this because this is accurate. These three vectors form a basis for a three-dimensional vector world. They form a basis. All vectors can be written as a linear combination of these. Now, I haven't defined those words for you, uh, but that is sort of math speak. But maybe you can just in, insinuate, <laughs> you just kind of, these three vectors form a basis, then all vectors can be written as some kind of sum of these, some sort of linear combination of these, like, like that. Now again, to me it's sort of a notational thing, okay, and so I, I kind of leap to this notation, which I, is, I think is easier and better, but, but we should understand both. And, and that, anyway, that little discussion had nothing to do with unit vectors except, well, except what do you, see, these are unit vectors. These are standard, these are called the standard unit vectors of, of space. Uh, so they're all one, one unit long. <clears throat> and we write every vector in terms of these standard unit vectors using I, J, K notation. I tend to abandon I, J, K notation and write it like this. I mean, it's implied that the I, J, K are there. It's, it's fine. Um, uh, but just coincidentally, I'm discussing that sort of coincidentally with the fact that you can make a unit vector out of any vector. You can make any vector one unit long by, by this little process. Uh, <clears throat> But this unit vector is not one of the standard unit vectors. <clears throat> um, all right, well, you know, I've given you kind of a good, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm laying out the big ideas, the, 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 you know, the phrases, the devil's in the details. I mean, I'm laying out the big ideas, but you get in there and do some homework and you'll find little detailed, interesting things that maybe I didn't talk about. I mean, or, you know, or ways to, you gotta practice homework and, and practice how to think in this world. Uh, and I'll help you with some homework. Uh, so maybe if you should work on some 11.1 and 11.2 homework. You know, let me just say this. You know, what, I got this list of homework. Um, <clears throat> In 11.1, it's 1, 5, 13, I, mean, I, don't, I don't have to write it down for you, but it looks like a big, long list. You know, here's one way to do homework. Check this out. I might do problem one. Uh, maybe I'll try, I'll skip up and do 17. Maybe I'll skip on up to do 35. Maybe I'll skip up to 50. Maybe I'll skip on up to 66. And maybe I'll try 78. Now, you know what I just did? I just did a nice sample of the homework from beginning to end. And you know how homework is. It starts simple, gets kind of medium, and then gets a little more challenging. Um, so that's, I don't know. I know people don't like to do what I'm just suggesting. People like to work linearly. Uh, but what I'm suggesting is I did uh, six problems, and I exposed myself to a lot of variety of homework. If you do just these six problems, um, you know, you, you, that's good. You're good at the beginning stuff, and you got a lot of work to do yet. I mean, I'm not saying you only do six problems. I'm just saying maybe you do those six, and then you go back and do some in-betweens. Uh, be nice if you did it all. Uh, but, but you're kind of regulating yourself. I'm just giving you some suggestions on how to how to hit, hit all aspects of the homework. Uh, I'm going to quit, and I'll see you Friday. Thank you again for listening. <clears throat> I'm in my office if you need me for questions.